This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khan Nam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have an incredible show today. And, you know, we're in the midst of another significant and probably catastrophic and devastating escalation in the war in Ukraine. Russia is moving away from central Ukraine away from Kyiv and heading toward the east and the south and has just put a new general, you know, uh, commanding the war effort, uh, a general that's known for his uh, atrocities being committed against the people of Syria in, Zir in Syria when he was commanding Russian forces there. So things are escalating. It's, it's going to get much worse. We're going to talk about that on the back end of the show today after we talk a little bit about what's happening uh, with the Israeli society's protection of Russian oligarchs and, you know, things that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks now starting to make the mainstream media. So we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about that. And also a group of rabbis recently has called for the, basically, I, I would say BDS against uh, U.S. funding of Israeli extremists uh, in occupied Palestine. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. But before we get there, we're going to be speaking with uh, Professor Rabab Abdelhadi, the director of the Ahmed program at uh, San Francisco State University, he did a really incredible uh, interview with her about Janin. Janin is a Palestinian city that has been coming under attack by Israeli military uh, because a lot of the attacks in Tel Aviv recently have been coming from people who have originated or are from Janine, and uh, the Israelis engage in collective punishment that is pretty severe. In fact, I would say, and I don't want to get too off track here, but the Russian playbook of, you know, collective punishment and attacks on civilians seems to be coming right out of the Israeli playbook. But um, we, we're going to hear from Professor Abdul Hadi about uh, why Janine. That's right. And, and Jess, uh, Janine has a history of resistance going back to 1948. Right. And of course... Today is the 20th anniversary since the last invasion of Jenin and massacre of, of uh, people in Jenin at the refugee camp when Israel basically went into a major uh, operation uh, in, in the Jenin refugee camp. So uh, let's watch and listen to Dr. Rabab Abdel Hadi. Two Palestinian women have been killed by Israeli forces in separate incidents in the occupied West Bank. One of the women was identified as Ghada Ibrahim Sabatin, a widow, mother of six. She was unarmed. Israeli occupation soldiers have been launching raids and arresting people in the town of Jenin and its surrounding villages, home of the suspected attackers in the Tel Aviv area. At least 10 people were wounded in confrontations in Jenin, as well as, as in Jericho and Tulkarim. 24 arrests were made in various occupied West Bank cities, according to the Palestinian Prisoners Club. The recent violence has come amid heightened tensions during Ramadan, after violence flared during the Muslim holy month last year, leading to 11 days of devastating Israeli assaults uh, on Gaza. Joining us to discuss this and more, Dr. Rabab Abdelhadi, founding director and senior scholar of Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies program at San Francisco State University. Welcome again to Arab Talk, uh, Rabab. Thank you for having me, Jamal, and I'm happy to be back at Arab Talk and KPO. So this is not the first time that Israel has targeted Jenin, nor it is the first time that fighters from Jenin attacked Israelis. There was the Battle of Jenin, of course, of 1948, uh, when Israel uh, failed to occupy Jenin after its residents, with the support of Iraqi soldiers, drove them away. It is also 20 years to date since the massacre of Jenin, which took place in the Jenin refugee camp on April first until April 11th of 2002. Please give us some historical context about resistance in Jenin. Yes. Uh, well, uh, Jenin, first of all, Jenin is like other Palestinian cities that has, and towns and areas, has been very much involved in the 
in the in the, in the, in the in the in the resistance against Israel, and it's also it's part of the historical Palestinian resistance against colonialism. And just like any other people who are occupied, they are of course are going to be resisting uh, their occupation. Uh, Jenin is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm also proud uh, to say that actually my father hails from Jenin. My father was born and my family, my fam father's family originally hails from Jenin. This is an area that is also geographically is located between the, uh, the, the coast, the Mediterranean coast of Palestine and uh, the Jordan River. It is, it is part, part of it is mountainous. It's very well known for its olive oil production, uh, by the way. And it's also a place where uh, uh, fighters, and whether you're talking about the 20s, you're talking about uh, 19, uh, uh, 1936-39 revolt, you're talking about 1948, you're going on uh, forward. So historically, it has been targeted just like other Palestinian um, uh, areas, cities, villages, and refugee camps after 1948. We remember that there were no refugee camps before Palestine fell and Israel was founded. In 1949-50, the United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian Refugees established 59 refugee camps in the region, in, 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 the, in the areas that were not by that time occupied by Israel, West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, uh, Syria, and Lebanon. And they were supposed to be actually temporary. I mean, some of the leases for some of the refugee camps now are coming up. They're supposed to be for 99 years. And then they're supposed to be temporary because, as we know, as the talk is today, very much in the news about Ukraine and other places, refugees are, are called refugees because they're seeking refuge from the places of their homes to another place. And that is supposed to be a temporary situation for them to be resettled back into their homes when they are able to come back. Of course, Palestinian refugees, at the time it was 750,000, or three quarters of a million in 1948, Today, we're talking about five, six million Palestinians who continue to have the refugee status, who continue to have the ID, the refugee ID that says uh, a refugee that is actually makes it very difficult for the travel document and so on and so forth. This is part of the whole question of what does it mean to be a refugee. Jenin and its refugee camp have actually also been very much part of the struggle against uh, Zionist colonialism. I do remember in 2002, in particular, when Israel reinvaded uh, Palestinian areas in 2000, following Sharon's invasion of the Aqsa Mosque on uh, September 28, 2000, and the, the battle escalated in 2001, uh, as like other Palestinian areas, like, for example, the old city of Nablus in, in Hebron, in, uh, in uh, Beit Lahad Hesha refugee camp, in uh, Ramallah, or throughout, throughout the Palestinian areas, and Palestinians in 1948 also participated. 13 people were martyred in October 2000. Uh, Palestinians resisted, as all people resist their occupation. Of course, today we hear in the news that Palestinians are terrorists because they are resisted, but nobody uh, thinks about uh, not only what's happening today in the Ukraine, but also what happened with the French resistance, the partisan against the Vichy government and, and Nazi occupation. People hail, it was last month, the anniversary of the Warsaw, Warsaw Ghetto uprising, in which uh, the Jewish residents of the Warsaw Ghetto rose up against Nazism and resisted. Uh, people always talk about resistance to colonialism, and but uh, the Zionist movement and its supporters always try to present it as if Palestinian resistance is exceptional. So um, I, th I guess this is maybe some of the historical where is more, so well, much more. Well, well, yeah, well, well, let's actually break it down a little bit because also people don't realize, uh, you know, that there is a refugee camp in, in, in Jenin and, and that refugee camp in Jenin, where did these people come from? You know, uh, I mean, it was established in 1953, but most of the camp's residents originally hail from the Carmel mountains and uh, the Haifa region, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so, so, I, so when, you, when some of them try to enter what supposedly 1948 Palestine, whatever, a lot of their parents were born or grandparents were born in Haifa and its surrounding they're villages. Home. They're going home, Jamal, and I know that uh, many people, for example, in the Jenir refugee camp come from a village called Ein Hod, which is in the Haifa area and the Carmel area. Airhod was one of the Palestinian villages that was not destroyed 
1948. We know uh, Dr. Salman Abu Sitte and other geographers, uh, Tafakji and others have actually documented at least 532 villages that were completely destroyed. And the only thing that remains, maybe a couple of stones, maybe um, uh, a cactus and so on. But the people, there is a lot of people from Abu Dhesha, Abu, Abu, uh, uh, Abu Heja family, who came from Ain from, uh, um, Hod, and some continue to live next to Ain uh, Hod, which is taken over, by the way, not by the zealot uh, uh, right-wing Israelis, actually by artist colony, by Israeli liberals, who proclaim that they want to bring beauty to the land, but they are actually living on Palestinian lands. And yesterday I was looking at pictures, and I saw again the, 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 the photo of the olive press, the big olive press, and it's for me it connected in my mind Janine because of the olive a producing area in the Janine area. There is the olive press there that's displayed as an Israeli museum for people to come and see. And I was just wondering, does this olive press uh, yearn to the olives that it's supposed to be pressing cold? And what has happened? So then a lot of people have been displaced from Ain uh, Hod. Some of the people are living in Ain uh, Hod, the Arab Ain Hod, which many people do not know because Israel promotes Ain Hod as a as artist uh, colony, as a sign of civilization, as a sign of how Israeli colonists came in and took over, just like what's happening in the U.S. and in other places, uh, proclaiming to take artifacts of uh, indigenous people. And then many have gone uh, to Janine refugee camps. So the Janine refugee camps is full, actually, of people who've been displaced from uh, their areas, uprooted and displaced and kicked out of their homes in 1940. In, in, in 2002, there was the massacre of Jenin, or sometimes referred to as the Battle of Jenin, which people shouldn't confuse it with the Battle of Jenin of 1948. Uh, and there were discrepancies about the numbers of the number of Palestinians who were killed there. Initial reports were saying they were in the hundreds, but then in the United Nations in July of 2002 issued a report indicating that at the time 52 Palestinians have been killed, uh, but we know that thousands of them were made homeless because uh, Israel with its bulldozers, caterpillars, destroyed half the camp. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes and made families homeless again. Um, you've been there and, and you visited uh, Janine and the camp. Uh, tell us about your impression when you went there. Yes, actually, uh, we visited the camp. It was late April, early May of 2002, right after the camp was destroyed. And uh, we went through the camp with uh, uh, only some of the young people who survived. We met with, uh, you know, every Palestinian refugee camp has a popular committee that's established by Palestinians and whose job is it is to negotiate with the UNRWA and with other authorities, the welfare of the camp, speak for the people in the camp, and so on. So we contacted the, well, the, the popular committee. The popular committee took us around. We went to the house that there was a battle in which uh, Palestinian fighters basically stood up to Israel. Israel was, try, was coming in with their bulldozers, with their helicopters with their uh, killing and so on. And, and I cannot forget the scene of the seeing the brain matter of Palestinians on the walls there. And then we went out and there is a huge rubble that was big, huge, that has all these pictures of children's shoes, of clothes, and that people who are don't, can't, don't even all their, everything. It was a complete, complete, huge rubble. I mean, people talk about Tora Bora sometimes, what happened in Afghanistan in 2001 after the U.S. invasion. And but the, some of those images were so shocking, Jamal. And you're talking to people and people say, well, this is the third, fourth, fifth time I've been displaced. And by the way, some of the numbers now are saying 63. We do not know how many. We do know at that time that Israel also uh, took the bodies of people, uh, bodies of the martyrs, and buried them in what Israel calls number cemetery, numbers uh, cemetery. And this, uh, you know, there is a big group, Palestinian group called We Are Not Numbers. Number cemetery labeled them and still holds hostage the bodies, not only Palestinian prisoners, but also the bodies of people who were killed holding them hostage in order to extract concessions from their families, humiliate them, violate one of the sacred tenets of any religion, 
that burying the dead to, 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 to honor them and also to bring the family closure. So imagine families who have not been able to get the bodies of their family. We've met some of the families later on also who had whose bodies were given, the children were put in like 5,000 minus uh, degrees centigrade. And you know, then they have to, you have to wait for them to freeze. And then one of the fathers said, the hand is here, the hand is there. How am I going to, what am I going to do? And the mother is saying, what am I going to do for my child? How am I going to, I mean, some of the, the Palestinian fighters, the Lal al from 1978, her body is still being held by Israel until now. And it's, so a common, Israel, it's, it's a common practice like, for the, it's for a the common Israelis. Practice. It's like a collective punishment, and right. it's a collective punishment. It's not only a physical collective punishment that destroying homes, because people talk about collective punishment, and it was mentioned in all the reports, whether you talk about Bit Salem, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, United Nations, every single report that comes out, of course, Palestinians speak about it all the time. But because the history is written by the victors and because we are living in a country where the dominant discourse actually supports the oppressors, supports the Israeli narrative, it is not even understood what pain, what is the psycho collective trauma that inflicts upon people when you also destroy their homes, when they decide today which, which spoons they take out which pictures they leave behind, which, how can they get out the children and so on. And this is the story that has continues happening. It's a recurring trauma of the Palestinians. In top of it also, what does it mean not to be able to actually even bury your child and to bury your dead and, be, and give them honorable burial and be able to just have some closure? The loss itself is really huge, but imagine what does this mean? And I, and I think, I don't think sometimes people, unless they have gone through some of these experiences, can understand, and also, of course, the, the, the dominant media has does an excellent job of, of erasing Palestinian narratives and hiding these truths. Well, so we're, talking was, about, we're talking about the media now. I mean, you're an expert, uh, of course, uh, also on race and resistance. Uh, Palestinians have been occupied for decades, yet the resistance uh, has been labeled as terrorism by Western media. On the other hand, as you, we've been witnessing on a daily basis, Western media is marveling over Ukrainian resistance uh, of uh, Russian invasion. How will you be able to reconcile or to explain this to your students when you teach your next course on race and resistance at San Francisco State University? Well, I am actually teaching one of my courses is on colonialism, imperialism and resistance. And uh, one of the topics is actually thinking about it. And the students themselves, I don't even, sometimes I actually haven't even approached the subject completely because it wasn't part of the curriculum when I designed the curriculum and revamped it in January and we started the course. But the students themselves see the hypocrisy and see the ways in which the power, I mean, the, the, the media as, as you know, you, you, nobody needs to tell you, Jamal, I mean, you're one of the leading journalists. The media does, does, uh, is supposed to reflect what's going on, but it also analyzes what's going on. And it has a role, whether the media admits it or not, in directing things. And some of the media is deliberate about that, especially the media that serves corporate interests, especially military corporate interests and so on. The media that is very much connected with the Israeli establishment, with the right-wing establishment, and with the ideological think tanks and so on. And we do know, for example, if you want to look at the paper of record, so-called the New York Times, for example, the way it covers it. If you, and there was a, yesterday, the, the, if you look at the magazine of the New York Times, there was a lot of commentary about the ways in which pe pe people felt so uh, uh, sympathetic with, and, the, and actually they used the word innocent Ukrainians. And it was very interesting because it reminded me of San Francisco State in 2009, when the Muslim Student Association wanted to do a benefit for the Fasaton during Ramadan uh, and to benefit the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And they said, this is benefits the innocent victims in Gaza and all hell broke loose. And I remember getting calls from the Dean of Students, getting calls from the Dean, getting uh, the president's office. Everybody was up in arms is that, how do you do this? And I said, it's okay, it's okay. The students said humanitarian crisis, because if you say innocent, Palestinians are not allowed to be innocent. Ukrainians are allowed to be honest. And actually on, on, on the news, we saw a grandmother, Ukrainian grandmother, actually showing how she makes Molotov cocktails. And she said, I downloaded it from the media and everybody's hailing it. Meanwhile, when you talk about Palestinians using stones, 
not even Molotov cocktails, in the face of, of a massive Israeli uh, weapon industry, whether you talk about tanks, um, um, submarines, uh, helicopters, B-52, uh, Iron Dome, and you're talking about at least, at least, at least 200 nuclear uh, weapons and so on, when there are the Palestinians are called terrorists, and then not only that, on top of it also, Palestinians are represented as if it is in their DNA to be bloodthirsty. So if you can think about the Palestinian, if the, ima in the imaginary, in the, in, the, in the dominant imaginary, the Palestinian is a terrorist. The definition of a Palestinian is a terrorist. Intifada is a violent movement. Rising up and resisting is violent. But while for other people, it is allowed to do so. And the hypocrisy, that's included there is actually intentional. It's not accidental. None of it is accidental. All of it is deliberate and is in intentional in order to advance a particular agenda and in order to denigrate the Palestinian agenda for liberation that is, despite all this media and despite all this meaning, is actually achieving victories and, 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 and making the Israeli project fail. I mean, the Israeli settler colonial project in Palestine has failed, has failed to crush the Palestinians has failed to erase them from their from the land of their of their in, uh, ancestors and has failed to erase the narratives as well so there is this battle to completely crush and because they are bullies they tend to be bullier and they tend to to continue doing this but it's it's shocking it's really shocking to think about how is the ukraine being presented as if we're living in twilight zone i mean sometimes you think about well, uh, didn't you uh, see, I mean, there was one time when the New York Times put the pictures of all the children who were killed in Gaza on the front page. And of course, all hell broke loose because all the Zionists were, were outraged. How dare you put pictures of children? Now you, you want to talk about innocence. Does innocence apply to Palestinian children or Palestinian children also are not even allowed to be innocent victims. Well, well, let me tell you something. I mean, we know, for example, the media for many years, whether it's in Palestine or in Iraq, uh, didn't show images of death and destruction. I mean, that's the attitude here because I used to always say, people always to ask me, why did, why does the U U.S. media or Western media in general sanitize images? And I said, I always said, well, because uh, the corporate. Uh, controllers did not want to see Americans choke on their Cheerios uh, in the morning as they watch the news. They wanted to gloss over this. Now we are seeing the media like CNN, especially in the late night, CNN International, which broadcasts also on CNN here, showing images of death and destructions, uh, be it, albeit sometimes they blur the faces of the victims, but they do show the bodies. They have never bothered to do that in Iraq. They have never bothered to do that for victims in Palestine. The Palestinian mother of six who was killed, they didn't show her lying down, although we saw her images all over Arab media, you know. And in, in fact, they've taken the Israeli side by saying initially that she was suspicious and she was, they fired in the air asking her to halt. What? She was going home. She was going home when I killed her in Bethlehem. And initially, the Israeli media tried to paint her as a terrorist carrying a knife, which she wasn't. Not a single news outlet in the United States spoke on her behalf the way they speak on the behalf of Ukrainian victims. Jamal, I mean, they, she actually bled to death because they shot her in the feet, but they did not allow people to carry yes. her body, yeah. to pick up her body to take her to the hospital. I mean, this is something that actually keeps get, getting repeated because we do remember uh, then uh, the, the, in, 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 in 2014, Israeli, Israeli medic, Israeli medic stood on top of the Abdel Fattah Ismail in uh, Hebron and shot him while he was wounded on the, on the street. They're supposed to take him in the ambulance. We know that Baruch Goldstein, who committed the massacre in the, in the Ibrahimi Mosque in, 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 uh, in February 1994, was a doctor. So the whole question about kind of, and I believe part of the reason that they sanitize this and the way the story is written is to devoid it from humanity. So uh, the people who are, there is more and more and more support for Palestine. There is more and more and more recognition for Palestine and so on. And there is more and more and more attempts by the Zionists, by the Israeli lobby, and their supports, including at my own university, San Francisco State University, to silence the story and silence Palestine and not allow us to actually be able to teach. 
because once students, and we know that, when we talk about the massacres against indigenous people, we're talking about the lynching of black people in slavery, we're talking about slavery itself and its horrors. Once people realize what has happened, at least majority of the people of good conscience will do something about it, will not stand by it. So one of the weapons by Israel lobby and its right-wing supporters and, 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 and liberal Zionist supporters is to shut down the story, to silence the story. If you silence the story, then nobody would know, then everything goes, uh, goes around um, business as usual, and it enables that story to continue. And the myth of Israel as quote unquote, the only democratic state in the region, people even forget about the Israeli law that, 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 that legitimized Zionism and that basically it's an apartheid law and so on. People will forget about it. So how can you keep, keep the story going? By silencing and shutting down possibilities of discussion, imagery, talk about it. Well, we have a few minutes left. Uh, you've mentioned what's happening at San Francisco State University in last time when we've had you on the show with uh, your colleague, Dr. Tomomi, uh, talking about also the silencing of, of you for for many years now, and of course, Dr. Tomomi, she also has a hearing ongoing. Yes. Uh, yes. Dr. What's going yes. on with this? Yes, uh, Dr. Kinakawa actually had uh, their hearing on March 18th, and it was uh, similar to my hearing about the violation of our academic freedom and silence in Palestine by San Francisco State administration in collusion with Zionist groups, just like, like the Lofay Project, Jewish Community Relations Council, Hillel, the Israeli Consulate of San Francisco Anti-Defamation League and others, as well as right-wing groups like Campus Reform, Congressman, Colorado Spring Congressman, Doug Lamborn, uh, um, um, the Christians United for Israel. Uh, many, many groups have actually come together and, and, and in order to shut us down, and they collaborated with Zoom, uh, the, the private tech uh, giant, to shut down our classroom, open classroom, in September 2020. I filed the grievance. I had my grievance on September 30th. A unanimous faculty hearing panel chosen randomly uh, from our colleagues ruled unanimously that San Francisco State harmed us, me and my, my colleague, Dr. Kinakawa, demanded that the university apologize to us and demanded that the university facilitates our webinar without any impediments and without allowing Zoom to shut us down. And they said specifically that SFSU collaborated with the Lawfare Project, which is an Israeli lobby group. Now, uh, we thought that uh, th this will be okay. And my colleague, Professor Tumam Kinekawa, actually thought that well, this is going on. Why should I even grieve? Maybe I should withdraw my grievance. But then President Mahoney, the president of San Francisco State University, vetoed the decision by the faculty, which speaks to the lack of democracy and lack of respect for shared governance and dismissiveness and belittling of faculty stance and, and views and so on. So my colleague, uh, Tomomi Kinekawa, decided to continue. She had a grievance on March 18th. And the grievance was going well until uh, the father of the representative of San Francisco State Labor Relations passed away. Now, San Francisco State could have easily had put a second person who was actually already working on the case to represent them, because we're talking about the whole institution. Uh, but San Francisco State decided, because I, we believe that the grievance was going so well, to shut it down and re-adjourn uh, it. And they only yesterday, so Friday, gave us the link uh, the Zoom link to the grievance tomorrow. The grievance is going to be tomorrow at 10 a.m. PST, California time, 1 p.m. AEST, 8 p.m. Palestine. We really would like everybody to come and hear. We will re-adjourn uh, the hearing tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, I testify uh, our colleague, uh, graduate student Salim Shahade, who's doing his research now in Palestine, will be testifying. We'll hear from the university. And then in 14 days, we will be able to hear the decision from the faculty hearing panel. And in the meantime, we are also, we have another hearing, as you know, uh, that about Ahmed and the breach of contract and San Francisco State attempt to dismantle the Ahmed studies program, precisely because they don't want us to teach. They don't want us to teach about Palestine. They don't want people to know about what's going on. So they have this, and the faculty hearing panel also demanded that the university apologize to me they said that the university created a hostile work environment and demanded that the university immediately hire the two faculty that, that I was promised in my contract in 2007, 15 years later, at the associate or full professor level 
in order for us to be able to build the program. Now, this is, this is President Mahoney also vetoed that decision again in her undemocratic, disrespectful manner of the students, of the faculty, of shared governance and so on. Uh, there are already now calls by people like Robin J. D. D. J. Kelly, by Richard Falk, by many others demanding the resignation of President Mahoney. We should just remember, just to connect it with California politics, that President Mahoney was appointed by former chancellor of CSU Castro, who has been exposed as having covered up sexual harassment and other corruption scandals. CSU Board of Trustees was going to, re to reward him by giving him a sweetheart deal if it was not for the outrage by the students, union, and faculty that now they had to back down from that. And so we are determined to hold President Mahoney accountable, the Board of Trustees of CSU, and we are determined to continue. We are not going to be silent. Please join us tomorrow for the grievance of uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Tomomi Kenakawa. Please join us in terms of the struggle for Palestine, in terms of the struggle for justice for all. Dr. Rabab Abdelhadi, thank you for coming on Arab Talk. Thank you for having me. That's the voice and the face of uh, Professor Rabab Abdelhadi, director of the Ahmed program at San Francisco State University, giving us an incredible history lesson about why Janine Jamal. And uh, from what Professor Abdelhadi says, I guess it's no surprise that the you know, history of resistance to the brutal uh, occupation of Palestine by the Israeli military and over the years since 1948 and even before, it's not too surprising that uh, Janine has this incredible history that goes back to 1948. That's right, just many people don't know that Israel actually, or at the time, uh, the Zionist gangs, the Ergug, Ergun and, and others occupied mm -hmm. Janine in 1948 because of its right. proximity to the Mediterranean. You know, right. Janine is not too far from, uh, let's say, Netanya and, and so forth in, in 1948, Palestine. And so the map of 1967 map, which is the West Bank, would have been different. But because of the resistance of the uh, people in Janine, uh, supported by the Iraqi army that right. was uh, there, they were able to push back the, the Israelis. Otherwise, Janine would have been uh, occupied in, in, in 19, 1948. And, and, and then the other thing is the establishment of these camps starting with, I think, 1952, 1953, right. to house the refugees uh, who came from 1948 after the Nakba. Well, guess what? Most of these people who live in, in the camps come from Haifa, from, again, right. the coastal town, right. the Haifa region and surrounding villages. And, and, and so when people reference Janine, oh yeah, Janine and the refugee camps were the center of uh, resistance, etc. Well, there is a big meaning to this because these are the children and the grandchildren of the refugees of 1948. That's exactly right, Jamal. And I think what's really critical and essential to the analysis here is that we, we, we have to talk about the resistance from Janine in light of what's happening globally with the resist resistance that is coming out of Ukraine against R Russian occupation. And again, we're seeing the hypocrisy, you know, globally uh, in terms of the mainstream media, you know, celebrating the resistance coming out of Ukraine, but um, basically either falling si silent or demonizing the kind of resistance that is coming from occupied Palestine. So I think it's important to put that kind of context in the current situation, especially when we talk later on in the show today about what's happening in Ukraine. But, yeah. you know, that that's why the the analysis from Professor Abdul Hadi in your interv interview is so critical, because it contextualizes historically kind of the resistance to occupation that's been going on in Palestine for, you know, three quarters of a century now, you know, going on three quarters of a century. So moving on to Ukraine, just Israel has expressed uh, repeated support for Ukraine, uh, whose president uh, Vladimir Zelensky is Jewish. It has sent humanitarian aid, set up a field hospital in Western Ukraine and voted on Thursday to suspend Russia from the United Nations Human Rights Council. But it has not sent military equipment or enforced formal sanctions on Russian oligarchs, why? 
Well, Jamal, let's let's I just want to add to your analysis, which was, you know, spot on, nor has the Israeli elite military or the government criticized Vladimir Putin or Russia directly. So, you know, there's been international condemnation, except from other thuggish dictor, you know, dictators in, in the region or close allies of, of Vladimir uh, Putin. But the Israelis, who are allegedly close allies of the United States, and want to be held out as a Western, you know, Western ally have refused to criticize uh, Putin, have refused to criticize Russia, and as you say, have housed, protected, and uh, lent economic protection to the Russian uh, Israeli oligarchs who are flooding uh, Israel right now uh, for protection. And your, your question, which is really good, well, why? The answer is pretty straightforward. It requires a lot of detail. Is because these Russian oligarchs who are on these uh, these lists globally and internationally to you know have their assets seeds, they get protected by the Israelis because the oligarchs have funded extremist activities, uh, is Israeli settler colonial activities, and other kind of activities in the apartheid regime of Israel. So Israel is playing this dirty dual game, right? By somehow voting in the UN to take Russia off the U United Nations Human Rights uh, Council, but refusing to condemn Russia and also housing all these Russian oligarchs who have, um, who have been you know, called out and are now internationally condemned and are supposed to have their assets seized. Jamal, it seems like the Israelis aren't gonna let them be extradited. No, and uh, just to give this more context, Jess, uh, well, Israel now, uh, at least the population reports from Israel say that there are 9.2 million uh, Israeli citizens, and, and this figure includes uh, Palestinians, who 1948 Palestinians. But about 13% are from the former Soviet Union. Hello. And so, so this is 13%. And, uh, you know, many of them has, have, have uh, you know, they've risen, risen to prominence and became ministers and, and leaders and, and, and players uh, such as Avigdor Lieberman, who, who hails from Moldova, and Ziv Elkin, uh, he's now right. a, a, a current minister, uh, and others like... Uh, uh, Yitzhak Merkavelli, who owns the right-wing television channel, controls many media outlets in Israel that ha that help shape public dis discourse. And of course, the most prominent we keep hearing about is Roman Abramovich, right? We keep right. hearing about him, the billionaire, basically, who Britain kicked out uh, because of his links to Vladimir uh, Putin. And, and but he's also an Israeli citizen. So there are a lot of them, and he's a major, major donor to Israeli institutions. And the list goes on, it's a, it's a, right. it's a big list. And so, for example, you get uh, Avigdor Lieberman who held many ministerial uh, positions. Uh, now he's the finance minister. Believe it or not, he was at, at, one, at one point the housing minister responsible for also the West Bank. <laughs> right. I mean, here is he, he right. is an immigrant from Moldova who became the housing, but now he's the finance minister. So they recently, they've asked him to take a position about Russia and uh, and the Ukraine and to, to comment on the atrocities in uh, Bucha in the, in the Ukraine. And then this is what this is what he said. He said, Russia is accusing Ukraine and, and Ukraine is accusing Russia. We Outrageous. need to maintain Israel's moral stand on the one hand and Israel's interests on the other hand. This was his response as people uh, were being slaughtered, right? And he says, well, they, they, they're both kind of like, you know, trying to equate well, between right. the two things. Right. And but what he's what he's trying to say, Jamal, is that Israeli apartheid Israeli interests align with Russia and Vladimir Putin. And they, like all these other thuggish countries, are going to support Vladimir Putin. They're going to throw some crumbs to the West by voting, you know, to expel Russia from the Human Rights uh, Council in the United Nations. 
but the real kind of um, strategic alliance that the uh, apartheid regime has with Russia is clear and unambiguous. And again, Jamal, I, I it, you know, it's not a, it's not that far uh, a stretch to see that the military engagement that Russia has in the Ukraine is not that different at all from the way the Israeli military practices their military uh, attacks on Palestinian civilians. And, you know, the three wars in Gaza, 2009, 2012, 2014, no, 2000, yeah, 2009, 12, and 14, you know, where thousands of Palestinian civilians were killed, were slaughtered, hospitals were targeted, you know, civilian infrastructure was targeted, and thousands of people died. Does that sound familiar to you at all? So let's let's call it what it is. Israel wants to maintain its moral standing, what? By supporting Vladimir Putin? That needs to be called out. Well, it is being called out and and and, and gives you an idea. And and of course, who pays for it? Palestinians, including the current uh, influx of of, uh, of Ukrainian refugees into Israel, where are where are they going to house them? At the end, in the settlements, it will be they will be housed in the settlements, just right. just the same way that the West Bank is occupied mostly by uh, immigrants from Russia and from the and and from other European countries and Brooklyn in New York, etc. That's going to be another another uh, wave of of right. immigrants taking over Palestinian land. No one talks about this because they're saying, well, look, Israel is now you know taking more. Of, uh, of the Jewish population without describing where these, uh, uh, you know, refugees are going to be settled and who's going to be paying, you know, an, uh, the expense of these, not the financial expense, right. but also right. paying by losing their land and housing, etc. Well, Jamal, I think that's a very good point. But uh, isn't it interesting that uh, President Biden today had a call with uh, Prime Minister Modi in India telling telling you know the prime minister of India you know quit uh, quit doing deals with Russia quit paying for their oil president biden and his uh, his uh, uh, security team have confronted china you know blinken has been speaking with the foreign minister in china saying hey you you got to take a stand on this so the united states is applying pressure to not even not even allies not even good allies i mean they they you know, we wouldn't call China an ally for sure, necessarily, but India is supposedly an ally. But what's the United States stance on the apartheid regime, Jamal, you know, housing these Russian oligarchs and refusing to condemn Vladimir Putin? I hear radio silence coming from the White House and well, the not, Congress. Not only this, but they're also not abiding by the sanctions. I mean, the only thing that they're doing now, they're telling them not to whatever, dock their boats, uh, their yachts. Not uh, to dock them in Tel Aviv or Haifa? Yeah, for more than 48 hours. That's the, that's a new order. But as you know, recently several leading Israelis, including, you know, I mean, prime minister and higher ups and uh, recipients of uh, basically lobbied to a asking that uh, Mr. Uh, Abramovich to be exempted from these sanctions. They, they wrote... Uh, uh, the American ambassador in Jerusalem to request that Washington spare him from the sanctions. This is this is this is public public yes, knowledge. Yes, sure, Jamal. Because does that sound does that sound like moral clarity to you? And you know, we know that he's a major donor and a major donor to settler organizations. Uh, just so that's why he's getting this kind of uh, exemption. Uh, uh, I mean, the only thing that Israel recently has done is asking its embassies this week not to accept donations from individuals face facing sanctions. Well, what about all the years before? Are they going to return all the funds? Well, well, are they but, going are they going to return I, the funds? And if they should return them, they should return them probably to some innocent Ukrainian citizens who lost their homes. But yeah, I, I think this whole thing, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the, the so-called, and I put it in quotations, moral clarity that Avigdor Lieberman uh, likes to speak about is, is proof of the hypocrisy and proof of, you know, the real allegiance that the apartheid regime 
has is not with the United States, I would say. I mean, they spy on the United States. They continue to spy on the United States. They continue to do all these dirty deals. The real allegiance, actually, of the apartheid regime are with thuggish countries like Russia, like Bahrain, like UAE, like Saudi Arabia. That's where their strategic interests are, Jamal. Here is the funny thing, Jess. This is the first time that I've been reading the New York Times and the Washington Post, etc., that they are now making reference that the population of Israel, 13 plus percent of it, uh, hail from uh, the Soviet Union. Because, you know, uh, this, this, this question about who owns the land, who is in the right. land and wherever, right. uh, it's usually uh, Western media tries not to talk about that, right? It's kind of like, uh, well, you know, very interesting. What, what the Palestinians complain about that they've been t- taken over uh, by uh, immigrants from foreign countries. All of a sudden now this has become part of the discussion saying, well, you know, 13% cannot criticize Putin because half of them speak Russian and the other half speak Ukrainians and the other half has families in Russia and the other half has families in the, you know, in the Ukraine. Well, this is the main problem that Palestinians have been talking about for years that, that basically colonial set, <laughs> the colonial, colonial settlers. settlers that are coming and invading their land, uh, ethnically cleansing it, taking it over pushing them away into refugees or into bento stands, which is happening now as we're speaking in, you know, in the West Bank, doing the same thing in the in, in, in the Naqab Desert, in the Negev Desert, which we talked about it last year. All of a sudden now they're trying to, they're now talking about the population makeup of Israel, which basically Israel tries to kind of keep it a secret, like not give you actual numbers about about this and trying to to say that everyone is indigenous to the land you know which is well this, this is the irony jamal i mean this is really really the irony you know we're talking about a brutal occupation of kiev and of ukraine and the whole world is up in arms palestinians have been occupied for almost 75 years now it's a brutal occupation militarized occupation and you know again radio silence and you know, we're, we have to keep talking about this because the parallels are painful. You see that Ukraine and Ukrainian citizens are being slaughtered, murdered mercilessly. The United States is throw, the United States and the world has thrown the Ukraine and Europe and NATO and the EU have thrown the Ukrainians under the bus. Things are going to get much worse. I mean, Russia is this new uh, commanding general you know, is known for his butchery in in Syria and uh, his attacks on civilians. This is the guy that's going to be leading the Russian military now in the Donbass region from Odessa all the way up the coast to the eastern side of the disputed territories. And it's going to get a lot worse for Ukrainians. And, um, you know, the Israeli government does not want to be on the right side of history. They do not have a moral compass. Obviously, they don't have a moral compass. So this idea of moral clarity, I would call it immoral clarity. They're very clear about their immorality, Jamal. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. And then on on this topic, uh, Jess, and this is something that you and I have spoken about. I can't even remember the year, but it's been over five years, uh, the story. I think think it goes back back maybe four years to 2018. Uh, basically um, organizations right here in the United States funneling uh, money to settler groups and and basically terrorist groups uh, and then calls, not even in the United States, but also in Canada to the IRS and its equivalent in Canada to investigate them. Well, guess what? Just today, uh, the uh, basically the rabbis uh, of several synagogues in in the United States went public with a plea to cut off U.S. Jewish funding of Israeli extremists. In a letter, uh, uh, nineteen rabbis, including ones with national and renowned names such as Angela Bagdal, Sharon Kleinbaum, and Amichai Lavey. Uh, pointed out that uh, w- that it was allowing tax-exempt funds that, that these different uh, organizations in this country to flow to Israeli right-wing extremists. 
Well, you know, Jamal, we have been reporting on it for four or five years. There is a groundswell. I mean, and this, this is why the timing of all this is so interesting. There's a groundswell at the grassroots level. This is from the bottom up of grassroots organizations worldwide, like Amnesty, <laughs> like, you know, the Harvard, we didn't even get to talk about this today, the Harvard Law Review, uh, you know, all and, and, you know, Israeli organizations too, who are condemning these, these kinds of activities. And now you have rabbis who are calling for, you know, the, who, who are actually better at calling for more moral clarity about why the United States continues to allow tax exempt dollars from the United States to go to another country to fund terrorist organizations. I would ask you, Jamal, if anybody else were to send money to an organization openly, you know, calling for ethnic cleansing of another group, would they be allowed to collect yeah, tax? I have tax one. I have one word uh, for you, Guantanamo. <laughs> Thank you. They would be in Guantanamo, or they would be in a supermax here in the United States. So and some of are... the money, just just to mention, the rabbi, rabbi said, uh, is going to Lehava, which we talked about them by right. the way. This right. is this is a group uh, which sends its thugs to the to Jer Jerusalem's old city and marching in Palestinian neighborhoods uh, uh, chanting death to the Arabs those are also the same groups that were involved in kidnapping a Palestinian right. kid and, right. and and burning him to death you know right right you know. Jamal so right. so they they are terror groups they are I, they call them extremist groups but they're actually they're a bunch of terrorists and and the thing is, uh, just that's why I said, just as a reminder, when we talked about it, this is going back to, to uh, you know, 2018, if, right. you, if you remember. And this is not far away from here. The San Francisco Jewish Community F Federation, basically in a report, uh, an investigation, came under investigation and they were funding basically some of these groups, uh, including Canary Mission, uh, an online blacklist targeting college students who criticize Israel, and they were embarrassed by it. And then later on, they stopped funding it. So it is not somewhere in the ether there, but this is including groups and big uh, so-called charity organizations that have been funding them with millions. You know, it's $2.4 billion we're talking about. It's a lot of money. In, 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 uh, in, in, and, and this, just I have to say one more thing, is that this is this, um, these rabbis, by the way, they've been contacting the IRS in, in one instance, for example, about uh, some of those charities sending them evidence. And so they have reported them there. And then recently, nothing has been done and this is this has been ongoing uh for for several years uh and then one of the former um, um, i guess lawyers who used to work for the irs uh, now uh, works for um, a law firm he said the irs receives a fair number of complaints and does not doesn't have the resources to follow up of many of them what I don't they, think it's resources. What the email means is the IRS did read the complaint and did decide there was enough to open an investigation. But then he says that, well, if, if so many years has passed by and nothing has been done about it, it means that they have basically shelved it. Well, that's exactly right. And I don't believe that it's a resource issue. It's a political issue that they're going to continue to allow basically tax exempt US dollars to fund terrorism. And, you know, as, as you said, and as you know, we've been talking about for years, if anybody else does that, they're on their way to Guantanamo or a supermax prison here in the United States. And there are lots and lots of people who have done far less than that, who are sitting in supermax prisons or, you know, in Guantanamo, who, who you know, don't have the same political luxury as, uh, pro-Israel donors here have in the United States being able to fund these terrorist organizations. But we're going to follow this, you know, continue to follow this, Jamal. This is not going to be a story that we're going to let up on. So we have a, a few minutes left, uh, Jess. But as you started the show, every week we talk about the show, things uh, seem to 
going to get worse, Jamal. Get worse. And, Much and worse. The, and the big news now is that Russia is on the brink of uh, kind of regrouping for another blitz. Yeah, they're going to blitz in the east, Jamal. You know, there's that whole region from uh, Odessa, which is strategically very important for Russia, all the way up the east coast into the Donbass region, which are the, quote, disputed territories that Russia is claiming. And they are amassing uh, the all of their military might and effort on those regions. There's going to be a mass uh, catastro- massive catastrophic event. You see Zelensky continuing to you know, beg for weapons and support in this area. Europe will fall short. The United States will fall short. And we're you know, bearing witness to these atrocities, Jamal, these murders, these, you know, this destruction of civil society and, and murder of civilians, and nobody's doing anything about it. I mean, again, I, I look at the narrative that the media, the mainstream media is portraying about the heroic, <clears throat> you know, uh, Ukrainian uh, resistance, and it is heroic, don't get me wrong. But when you see who's in charge now from Russia, this new general, and the military that's going over there with the support of the Belarusian military, with the support of the militaries from you know other kind of satellites of Russia right now, I'm really, really afraid of what's going to happen in the next few weeks. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to download uh, your latest episode. And we'll talk to you next week. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.